Hey what's up everybody, in this video I'm going to look at the stock of Procter & Gamble and try and figure out whether it's a good value right now. If you're new to the channel, my name is Dan, I do a lot of stock analysis on this channel, so hit that subscribe button if you're into that kind of thing so you can check out more videos like this one. Alright, let's get started. Alright guys, so Procter & Gamble sells lots of things that we all buy every day. Things that we all need. You can see they got diapers, laundry detergent. When you're sitting there in the aisle of the grocery store debating between two kinds of detergent or two brands of toilet paper, chances are Procter & Gamble owns both of them. So they're getting paid either way. And that is really the beautiful thing about their business. You know, they sell things that everybody needs. And everybody needs to keep buying repeatedly. And they have great brand power with that. So, in my opinion, it is a very stable business with a good moat. Now, Procter & Gamble does break their business down into five segments. You can see the revenues in millions of dollars in blue for each segment along with the operating profits in green. And so they're really not dependent on any individual segment. I would say the largest segment is fabric and home care, followed by baby stuff, feminine and family care. Here is Procter & Gamble's income statement for the past 10 years or so. What do we see here is a remarkably stable business with no losses in any year in the past 10 years. You've got profits of over $10 billion there in 2012, increasing to about $13 billion in, in the trailing 12-month period. So really not incredible growth, uh, but slow and steady growth over time. Here's some information on Procter & Gamble's balance sheet. You can see their total liabilities to total assets ratio is close to 60%. And of those liabilities, you see the debt makes up a somewhat significant portion. Not too bad though. Debt to assets ratio of 18.7%. So leverage is fair, not too high. As far as liquidity, their liquidity ratios here are not great, but that is not uncommon for, for someone in their industry. By the way, if you don't know any of these ratios, you can check them out in the description below. But they don't really have any solvency concerns. As you can see, they haven't reported a loss in any year in the past decade, probably more and their interest coverage ratio is over 30 so their pre-tax profits can cover their interest over 33 times extremely safe they are rather long-term asset intensive but i wouldn't get the wrong idea here they don't have huge factories on their balance sheet if you look at their balance sheet it's mostly intangible assets like brand names so overall a pretty good balance sheet i'd give it a b Here's a DuPont analysis. If you don't know what that is, you can watch a tutorial video in the description below. But really, it's pretty easy. All we're doing is looking at return on equity and breaking that down into its three parts. I like to look at about five years worth of data. Any one year by itself can be very misleading. So with that in mind, Procter & Gamble has a pretty good ROE here coming in at about 29.5% most recently. You know, they, they have had years that were a lot better than others, obviously, but you can see the average, you know, it averages around to be about 20% maybe, which is pretty decent. Now, it's made up of three parts. What I find very impressive is that their net income margin is reliably, you know, pretty high here for a company that sells physical products. That just shows you their brand power that they can charge so much. Net income margin tells you for every dollar of sales, how much do you keep in profit? You know, for Procter & Gamble, it bounces around. Most recently, it was 18.7 cents for every dollar of sales. Now again, there's companies with a lot better margins, but for their industry, I find this to be very impressive. 
asset turnover doesn't look that great you know that tells you how efficient you are using your assets to generate sales so 0.61 for every dollar of assets they can generate 61 cents in sales Eh, it's okay equity multiplier just captures the effects of leverage so you can think of the first two components as like organic profitability and this third component is just, you know, the effect of leverage. So yeah, that helps, but I would I, I'm more impressed with the organic components, especially the margins there. I think they have a pretty good business model going. It is a great value stock because they have a record of increasing their dividend every year for the past 64 years. And you can see that in blue here, nice steady increasing streak of dividends. Most recently they paid, let's see here, about $7.4 billion in dividends. Now in the red we have share buybacks. So those actually account for a significant amount of the money given out to shareholders. So in the past trailing 12 month period, $7.4 billion for dividends, but also another $1.3 billion in share buybacks. Now what I like about Procter & Gamble is that even after all these dividends and all these share buybacks, they still have a lot of money left over to reinvest into the company. So in blue you got the payout ratio. You know, if you ignore the bad year in 2019, this payout ratio is reliably under 60% in most years. Even if you add in the buybacks with the modified payout ratio, you're still looking at a you know 69, 63% modified payout ratio. That leaves them a lot of extra profits they can reinvest back into the company. Here is the stock of Procter & Gamble. It's trading at about 22 and a half times next period's earnings. It's yielding about two two and a half percent and they're about a $312 billion company. So if we look at the performance of Procter & Gamble over the past five years, it's up at 81.6% compared to about 115% for the S&P 500. That is pretty typical. I would generally expect that with a large stable company. It's going to be a lower risk than the index, but it's going to give you a lower return. Now, is Procter & Gamble a good deal right now? We'll do a deep dive, but just look at it briefly. We can look at their P.E. ratio historically, and we see that you know it has varied. It's always at least about 20 times earnings. You know, it's been up as high as 28 or so. During 2019, you see it jump up dramatically because the denominator in the P.E. ratio, the earnings, were just abnormally low that year. I think they probably had some write downs or something. Uh, but besides that year, you know, Procter & Gamble generally trades, again, at least 20 times earnings, but always less than 30. Okay, so here's what analysts are expecting for revenue growth for Procter & Gamble. It's not very impressive. It's just slow, steady growth, you know, for the next 10 years or so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these revenue growth estimates. And I'm going to incorporate them into my forecast for Procter & Gamble's cash flows and try and come up with intrinsic value. I'll be using the free cash flow to equity model to try and value Procter & Gamble. So again, I'm going to use those revenue estimates, kind of forecast a picture of Procter & Gamble's cash flows for the next 10 years, and then of course a terminal value. I will just assume that Procter & Gamble can grow their cash flows at about 2% per year for every year after the 10th year. Now with intrinsic valuation, you have to pick a discount rate to discount the cash flows back. I think given Procter & Gamble's low level of risk, a lower discount rate is probably appropriate here. I'm going to go with about 6.5% and let's see what we get here. Okay guys, this is the path I have for Procter & Gamble. I plug in analyst estimates for revenue growth rates here 
that gives me a stream of revenues for the next 10 years. To get from revenues to profit or net income, I need to know what their margins are going to be. Most recently, the margins were 18.7%, but if we take a five-year average, it's actually 16.2%. Being that they're really in the maturity phase, I don't see their margins improving or declining. I think it's better to just stick with 16.2% for the whole period here and just say that's the average. So I'm going to stick with that. So if you take revenues times 16.2%, that gives you the stream of net income or profit. Now one final step here, because we are the equity holders, we need to calculate reinvestment needs. So reinvestments in working capital, in capital expenditures, acquisitions, things like that. So the more you grow, the higher your reinvestment needs are going to be. Procter & Gamble is not expected to grow much. Therefore, we have a fairly low reinvestment rate here being used. And I'm okay with that because they're not growing much. That sounds fair to me. Uh, that gives us, once we subtract those reinvestments, that gives us the stream of free cash flows to equity. And now we can figure out the firm value. Okay guys, so here are the free cash flows to equity. Uh, I'm going to discount them back to present value with a 6.5% discount rate. We also have a terminal value here, which is equal to the cash flows in that terminal year divided by the discount rate minus 2%, which is the perpetual growth rate I'm choosing. Basically, I'm just assuming they can grow those cash flows at 2% in perpetuity. So anyhow, you want to discount that terminal value back to present value as well. You therefore have a total firm value consisting of these three components, and the grand total is about $280 billion dollars or about $113 per share. Now, unfortunately, Procter & Gamble is trading for quite a bit more than this right now. So according to our calculations, if you want a 6.5% return on your investment, Procter & Gamble really isn't going to be able to deliver that. All right, guys, so here are my final thoughts on Procter & Gamble. First thought is to hit that like button. Really supports the channel. Appreciate it. Okay, but second thought is this. I think Procter & Gamble has a really enviable business. They haven't reported a loss probably in decades. At least using the last 10 years, I don't see any losses being reported. They have great brand power. They sell things everybody needs, and everybody needs to keep buying them over and over again. Uh, they have a great balance sheet. I can't say enough good things. Uh, the only problem with Procter & Gamble, it's, it's a little too well known. It's known for being safe. So, you know, a lot of people flock to it as an investment. So it really ends up commanding a very high, you know, valuation, a very high P.E. ratio. Uh, so I don't really see, you, you know, I don't see big returns if you jump in at this point. That being said, I mean, it's a great stock to keep an eye on if the price ever dips down to a level where you see you can actually earn decent return. It's a great stock, you know, to jump in at that point. It's one of those things you would hold forever. On the other hand, it could be a good investment for you right now. A lot of the market is overvalued. A lot of people are worried about market turbulence this year. Nothing wrong with holding a stock like Procter & Gamble. You know, you get some kind of return on your investment. It's not going to be a lot, but you get something. And you're actually fairly protected against market downturns. Stocks like Procter & Gamble, normally they don't fall very much when the market goes down. So in that respect, you, you could then sell the stock if the market crashed. You could sell it at a small loss and go ahead and buy other and more volatile stocks. So it's kind of an in-between between holding risky stocks and holding pure cash. It's kind of hedging your bets there. So it could be used in that way. Uh, so anyhow, those are just my thoughts. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Thank you for watching.